good evening one and all to have a speaker good evening one and all to have a speaker again on a different topic it only shares two aspects number one speaker has immense knowledge that he can share his knowledge on different aspects of law and secondly he is very popular amongst the participants when participants are willing to hear his knowledge and the electricity act 2003 though has traveled the journey of around 17 years but there are still certain areas for which any common man because as they say bijli sadak and pani that is the electricity also plays a constituent role in one's life and to understand as to how the electricity act 2013 has developed from the electricity act of 1910 and electricity act of 1948 because it allowed certain privatization and some companies and as to whether how the telegraph act would apply when the laying down of the lines is there and what is the subtle difference between the word unauthorized connection and a theft because these as a lawyer or a common man we see largely there is litigation in in this regard as to whether the connection if there was some kundi connection as we say in punjab or unauthorized connection or once there is extra load whether it will fall within the preview and parameters of an unauthorized connection or if we are taking out an extra line and it's not connected to the meter whether it would be theft these are the certain journeys aspects which will be discussed and shared by mr nl raja a senior advocate of madras high court who is not only known in the commercial aspect field specialization the arbitration act but electricity act is also one of his main forte consequently take into all these aspects we requested mr raja to share his knowledge and as usual he was kind enough to accept to the same and share the knowledge and we will also be sharing the ppts which mr raja has prepared for this webinar amongst the group of beyond law clc so those who are connected in the group or the whatsapp they will be able to have the bird eye view subsequently in the though this video would also be uploaded on the our beyond law clc channel of youtube uh thank you sir and on a friday evening it's always a pleasure to hear you good evening uh, good evening all um i'm so glad that on a friday evening there are so many of you gathered to talk about a topic which is really not a very exciting one but still that shows the level of uh, interest that you have to learn law uh when the use of electricity it is said was demonstrated to the president of us he uh, then president of united states he is believed to have remarked this is all very interesting but would it have any practical use from that time uh, in about about 140 250 years electricity has traveled so much that it has become an integral part of our lives uh, we can't today imagine a life without electricity and next to air and water i think today it is the most important element in our lives whatever we do even the zoom call everything is possible only if we have electricity and it has become so integral to our lives um, there is a very interesting book by a writer called alvin toffler called future shock and he says if you are to condense uh, the entire life of humanity on earth into 24 hours then electricity was actually discovered in 23 hours and 48 minutes right uh, so if you take the entire life of humanity on earth and condense it to 24 hours um, electricity was discovered in the 23 hours 58th minute so just 2 minutes of that has made such a remarkable change in our lives and this is just the beginning the uh, type of changes electricity is going to bring into our lives is truly truly uh, going to be stupendous and there is also this observation that in the last 150 years 
the battle for supremacy between nations was between labor and capital entire uh, political systems were created around uh, um, capitalism and uh, communism which are basically economic principles and uh, we created entire political systems out of it but in the last about 10 to 15 years this has become irrelevant now if you have capital in china uh, you can probably engage labor in africa and if you have capital in the us you can engage people uh, down south in where i live and close to where i live karu uh, yero uh, so it really and there is a person who will be sitting in manhattan telling you the difference between the count of fabric uh, from a factory made in tirupur and uh, possibly a factory made in uh, karur or ero so that is the extent to which the village has become global so in this century what does a nation need to attain supremacy and uh, two aspects are very important for uh, among other things two aspects are important for a nation to attain supremacy in this uh, century and those two things are energy energy as in power as in the various types of uh, uh, energies we have today like the solar energy the wind energy uh, fossil fuels um, biomass uh, all these come within the nuclear all these come within the classification of energy and second is ideas right it is these two which are going to power a nation so it is electricity is really the backbone of all the progress that a nation can plan please bear this in mind and this is why it is today uh, essential to have a sensible law relating to electricity a user friendly law relating to electricity and a law that will be effective and produce results right so without that the nation cannot hope to progress at all so that is how integral electricity is to the progress of a nation and that's why we need to understand the nuances Uh, relating to the electricity act which is an important component in ensuring stable and better electricity now i would request the organizers to start my powerpoint presentation i'll take you through it as i uh, was info, uh, telling mr vikas this is a huge ocean so in a period of about an hour and hour and 15 minutes it's going to be very difficult for me to go into various nuances especially you will understand that this is a law in which uh, which is the concurrent list so both the state government and the central government have jurisdiction to deal with it and therefore there is a whole lot of uh, regulations that have been passed by state electricity regulatory commissions and the governments and therefore this is going to make the task of my presentation even more difficult because uh, for example if i tell you this is the position in tamil nadu it may not be the position in punjab it may not be the position in west bengal Uh, those regulatory commissions may have completely different laws that apply to them right please bear this in mind um, this is why i am trying to only concentrate on the general aspects of the electricity act 2003 the new and what has been dealt with by the supreme court of india um, can we have the powerpoint presentation the electricity act the next in india generation and distribution of electricity commenced with the demonstration of electric light in calcutta which was conducted on 24th of july 1874 by a company called fury and company then on 7th of january 1980 1897 kilburn and company secured the calcutta electric lighting license as agents of the indian electric company which is registered in london on 15th of january 1897 before uh, independence electricity generation and supply were concentrated in the hands of private uh, electricity suppliers these suppliers were largely in urban areas with the object of regulating the generation supply and use of electricity the first legislation relating to electricity was enacted as the electricity act of 1897 this legislation was subsequently replaced by the indian electricity act 1903 the indian electricity act was only a stop gap arrangement till a more comprehensive legislation came into effect um, and uh, therefore the electricity act of 1910 came into effect next next please The Indian Electricity Act 1903 was repealed, and it was enacted as the Indian Electricity Act 1910. And the Indian Electricity Act provided the basic framework for supply of uh, electrical energy. 
the sector being at a nascent stage required huge investments, which we envisage to be fulfilled by private license. So what is uh, very significant about this phase of electricity generation in our country is that much of it was in the hands of private entrepreneurs. Yes. And I should say we have come a full circle after trying, um, uh, then we went into completely state-owned SEVs as we call them, the State Electricity Board. And then that experiment having not worked very well, we, in 2003, we went back to private uh, privatizing most aspects of electricity sector. Next, please. Now the next slide. So under the provisions of the 1910 generation plans were established. The first one was to be was set up at Calcutta uh, and then uh, Bombay. Then with the independence of priorities change and electrification was planned to be extended across the length and breadth of the country. And therefore we needed a law to address this. Then therefore came the Electricity Supply Act 1948. And this act was based largely on the provisions of the UK Electricity Supply Act 1926. Next. There was substantial growth in the power sector in terms of installed capacity, transmission network and distribution to various areas across the length and breadth of the country. However, over a period of time, a number of problems surfaced, right? Uh, the SEVs, as they are called, the state electricity boards became financially sick and ridden with huge debts. And just before the Electricity Act came to be passed, the cumulative uh, uh, amount due to various agencies from ECBs exceeded 41,000 crores. The demand supply gap was huge. There was so much of demand for electricity, but then the state electricity boards were unable to supply this huge demand. The quality as well as quantity of power was poor. The vote bank politics compelled the tariff to be kept artificially low for the agricultural sector, which prevented the rationalization of tariff. While it is understandable that we must have a uh, low power tariff for agricultural sector. There's absolutely no logic to completely making it free for the farmers or uh, putting in place a system which did not permit the government to subsidize uh, the losses which were power sector generators were uh, incurring on account of free supply to the farmers. Next. The foundation of reforms was laid in the 1990s with the private sector participation being encouraged in generation. That is only in generation, mind you. Uh, PTC Power Trading Corporation was created for power trading and various other initiatives. Then the first attempt at reform came through the provisions of the Electricity Regulatory Commission Act and the purpose of which was to distance the government from tariff determination. Therefore, what was envisaged under the provisions of the Electricity Regulation Act was that the government will not have a significant stay, say, in the manner in which the tariff was to be determined. It was supposed to be determined according to the rules and regulations which were to be put in place by the Electricity Regulatory Commissions. Next, please. We have the next slide. So the objectives of the Electricity Act 2003 uh, can be stated to be as follows. Uh, to consolidate the laws relating to generation, transmission, distribution, trading, and use of electricity, for taking measures conducive to development of electricity industry, for promoting competition, for protecting the interest of consumers, uh, to ensure supply of electricity to all areas, rationalization of electricity tariff, ensuring transparent policies regarding subsidies, promotion of efficient and environmentally benign policies, constitution of authorities like the Central Electricity Authority, regulatory commissions and establishments of appellate tribunal, distancing tariff determination process from the government. So this broadly captures the various objectives of the Electricity Act 2003. Next. Electricity being a concurrent subject, as I told you earlier, 
a well-coordinated approach would be necessary for the development of the power sector. This is essential for the attainment of the objective of providing electricity access to all households and providing reliable, uninterrupted quality power supply to all consumers. The state governments have a major role, particularly in the creation of generation capacity, state-level transmission and distribution. The central government must assist the states in attaining uh, attainment of this objective. And it would be playing a supportive role in fresh capacity addition and a major role in the development of the national grid. So to say, the Electricity Act empowers the central government to lay down a broad framework within which this reform will happen. And uh, it is also duty bound to guide the development of this, uh, of the progress in electricity. You would frequently uh, read in papers that the central government has put in place um, you know, long um, uh, kilometers of transmission facilities that it is trying to pull certain SCVs out of the red by giving them grants. Then there is this Udai screen under which uh, state uh, SCVs are encouraged to subscribe and to get relief on the basis of certain conditions which are important for generating competition. So this is the coordination between the central government and the state government, which is very, very important for the development of the electricity sector. Next. I should tell you at this point that if you are going to specialize in the electricity laws, it is essential for you to know certain technical terms because electricity is a technical subject. If you don't know the technical terms, you will find that you are all, um, often getting tripped in before the commissions or the courts who will start throwing technical terms at you. So basically, you must understand certain terms uh, under the electricity. Once again, the terms and the uh, um, which are in use in the electricity sector are very many technical terms. And I have just put in here a few important terms which you need to uh, bear in mind. And once again, all this is with the purpose of kindling your curiosity, right? I may not be exhaustive in the manner of information that I'm giving you, but these are all pointers. These are things that you must look up and learn and try to understand these concepts before you get into the electricity sector as an actively participant, uh, a participating participant in the electricity sector. That becomes very important. And therefore, I would request you all to look up these terms and learn more about them. I am just giving you a bare uh, framework of what these actually mean. An electric current reverses its direction. A current that flows only in one direction always is a direct current. A current uh, that reverses its direction many times a second at regular intervals is an alternating current. Ampere is a unit of measure of intensity of an electric current. So you have an electric current flowing. You must also measure its intensity. It is measured in terms of amperes. Circuit is a closed path in which electrons from a voltage of current source flows. Circuits can be in series, parallel, or in any combination of two. A circuit breaker is an automatic device for stopping the flow of current in an electric circuit. To restore service, the circuit broker must be restored after correcting the cause of the overload or failure. That's a circuit breaker. Next, please. Next. A conductor, any material where electric current flows, you've all heard of good conductors and bad conductors, any materials where electric current can flow freely, uh, um, conductive materials such as metals have a relatively low resistance. Copper, aluminum wire are the most common forms of conductors. The flow of an electric charge through a conductor uh, is what is called a current. An electric current can be, it's like a flow of water in a pipe and it is measured in amphias, like how uh, well, flow of water in pipes is possibly measured in liters, this is measured in amphias. Uh, demand, the average value of power or related quantity over a specified period of time. Um, you would all, you will, you will hear um, terms like maximum demand, uh, minimum demand. This is basically indicates the average value of power or related quantity over a specified period of time. Then I told you the direct current is a current that flows only in one direction. An electron is a tiny particle which rotates around the nucleus of an atom and it has a negative charge of electricity. Next, please. A fuse, uh, 
This is very common, all of you would know about it. It is that thin metal rod which ensures that if there is going to be excess electricity flowing through the circuit, then the fuse uh, burns off uh, to prevent further damage to the equipment and to the system. And then you need to restore the fuse for that to function uh, effectively again. A generator is a device which converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. Um, and the ground is, you, all, you also have heard that you need to properly ground um, the electricity connections. That is the reference point in an electrical circuit from which voltages are measured, a common return path for electric current, or a direct physical connection to the earth, which is the most common form in which it is understood by all of us. And an insulator, uh, an insulator and a conductor are actually the opposite. And in, if an insulator is any material where electric current does not flow freely, insulator materials such as glass, rubber, air, and many plastics have a, have a relatively high resistance. Insulators protect equipment and light from electric shock. That is the purpose of an insulator. Next. An inverter is an apparatus that converts direct current into alternating current. And a kilowatt hour is a product of power in kilowatt and time hours equal to 1000 kilowatt hours. For example, if I am saying if a 100 watt bulb uh, is used for four hours at 0.4 K uh, watt hours of energy will be used. And this gives the conversion um, with regard to which, which helps you uh, to uh, measure the uh, product of power and time. A kilowatt hour meter is a device that is used to measure electrical energy use and a load is anything which consumes electrical energy such as lights, transformers, heaters, etc. Um, next. Power is the rate at which electrical energy is transferred by an electrical circuit and it is measured in watts. Power factor is very important. And you will um, hear about this quite frequently in the electricity laws. It is a ratio of actual electrical power dissipated by an AC circuit to the product of the RMS value, current and voltage. The difference between two is cost. Primarily, a power factor is an indicator of how efficient an electrical system is in an establishment. If you have a good power factor, which means that your electricity systems are running efficiently, the connections have all been given properly and uh, the uh, maintenance of the equipment has been done uh, well, all this is an indication of a good power factor. And the opposite is when you do not look, uh, okay, to take care of your equipment, it is all not structured properly, there is a lot of wastage of power, your power factor um, may be uh, low. A rectifier is an electrical device that converts an alternating current into a direct one by allowing a current to flow through one. The resistance, the opposition to the passing of an electricity current. So anything that has high uh, electrical resistance, um, you would possibly refer to it as an insulator. Anything that has low electrical resistance, you will refer to it as a conductor. Next. Turn to the next. So semiconductor is a solid substance that has a conductivity between that of an insulator and that of most metals, either due to addition of an impurity or because of temperature effect. Devices made of semiconductors, notably silicon, are essential components of most electronic circuits. Uh, that again is a huge industry, uh, making semiconductors um, and um, electronic circuits. This is why we have that Silicon Valley, which all of us have heard about. It is a huge uh, industry and is also into uh, making chips. That is a completely different uh, area uh, relating to computers. But um, primarily, semiconductors are something um, the, which uh, between that of an insulator and that of most metals, either due to addition of an impurity or because of uh, temperature uh, effects. When short circuit is one part, this is again, we have heard this quite often, when one part of an electric circuit comes in contact with another part of the same circuit diverting the flow of current from its desired path you say that there has been a short circuit. A transistor semiconductor or device with three connection transistor um, the application to electricity loss and the electricity um, area is a semiconductor device with three connection capable of amplification in addition to rectification volt ampere is a unit of measure of apparent power it is the product of RMS voltage and the RMS current. 
volt is a unit of measure of voltage when you have you know when you want to transmit power um, through long distances you use high voltage power so um, when you use high voltage power then there is lesser wastage of electricity and that is why you have this concept of step up transformer and step down transformer anything that is generated is then converted into high voltage it is then transmitted over long distances but then you have to receive it in your house uh, at probably between 100 to 220 volts and therefore it is all stepped down and uh, um, then it is in a position uh, where you can use it on your household articles so um, this is the and uh, this is how it is measured a unit of measure of voltage next Uh, voltage is an uh, electromotive force or pressure that causes electrons to flow and can, can be compared to pressure which causes water to flow in a pipe. The, the, the pressure that makes water flow in a pipe, you can compare it to the electromotive force that causes electrons to flow um, in, uh, through a conductor of electricity. Voltmeter is an instrument for measuring the force volts of an electrical current. This is the difference potential voltage between the different points of the electrical circuits. Voltmeters have a high internal resistance and are connected across parallel to the points where voltage is to be measured. Watt tower is a unit of electrical energy equivalent to a power consumption of one watt for one hour. You say that I'm using a 100 watt bulb, uh, then it means that it is using 100 watts per, uh, per hour, right? So this is, the, uh, this, is, this is what it is supposed to indicate. The next case. Watt, that again is uh, something which we have heard of quite uh, frequently. It is a unit of electrical power. One watt is equal to one joule per second, corresponding to the power in an electric circuit in which the potential difference is one volt and the current is one ampere. Watt meter, so you need to measure this. The um, equipment that you use to measure this is called a watt meter, is an instrument for measuring the electrical power in watts of any given circuit. So as I said, these are fundamental terms in electricity that you need to learn. There are more complicated terms, which you can leave safely to an electrical engineer. But if you are going into the practice of law, it is essential that you acclimatize yourself with the meaning of these terms and their application in electricity laws. Otherwise, understanding certain concepts of electricity law may become difficult. This is a very, very good area for youngsters to step in. Um, I have this one advice to all youngsters that if you want to um, develop a good practice, always keep looking out for emerging practices of law, right? The existing practice of law will usually be very crowded. Civil courts, criminal courts, existing uh, areas of practice may be very, very, very crowded. This is why you have to be constantly on the record for emerging areas of practice, because there the competition will not be as intensive as in the other areas. For example, GST today. GST is a huge area for practice uh, amongst youngsters. So you must read GST law. You must uh, attend webinars like this. Uh, you must uh, write articles uh, relating to that. Uh, you must uh, attend uh, conferences in which the nuances of GST law are going to be discussed. With all this, then you will pave the way for acquiring a practice in those laws because people who are doing well in traditional areas of practice may not be inclined to step into these fields because they are new and they don't want to risk getting into this. That is a huge opportunity for youngsters to step into these uh, areas, learn about them and therefore profit from that. Um, can you uh, go to the next slide? Policies are very important because they lay down the uh, path which, uh, which uh, uh, a sector has to travel. So under the provisions of the Electricity Act, um, one of the unique features of the Act is that it contemplates framing of policies regarding various acts, aspects dealt with in the Act. The framing of these policies must be the central government in consultation with the state government, electricity commissions, and wherever required stakeholders are also constructed, consulted. Framing of the national electricity policy, all of them have a statutory backing. Uh, the national electricity backing is section three of the act. National tariff policy uh, of a national electricity plan is section three, four. National policy permitting standalone system for rural areas. 
and the national policy on rural electrification and local distribution in rural areas. In respect of all these um, policies have been uh, set down by the central government, the policy gives the map, the direction in which the sector has to travel. That is the utility of a policy. And uh, having defined it in those terms, it is uh, essential that it is uh, visited, uh, revisited frequently to look into what improvements must be made. Next. One of the most important features of the de-licensing uh, in generation of electricity, one of the most important features of the act is that it provides de-licensing uh, in generation of electricity. There are just a few exceptions, primarily being hydroelectric generation or nuclear power generation. You can't now step into that without getting a license from the government. But all other types of uh, generation have been de-licensed. Section 7 of the act specifically provides any generating company may establish and operate and maintain generating station without obtaining a license under this act, which if it complies with the technical standards relating to connectivity to the grid referred to in clause B of section 73. Next. Next. Yeah, section 4, and these are all uh, the manner uh, in which uh, the um, generation of electricity has been uh, de-license. Hence, the following two conditions to be met to satisfy the requirements of this section is that the area should not be connected to the grid. That means the area should be an off-grid area. The area should be a rural area notified by the appropriate commission. Uh, if you satisfy that, you can set up a standalone system. Theoretically, it is today possible for a housing society. Let us assume that you are living in a colony which is about uh, 2,000 households, it is theoretically possible for you to set up a generating station and which will supply power only to that uh, station. How it is done is the power generated is once again um, pumped into the grid and from the grid the licensee, which is the state electricity board, is going to give you power in your household. But the point is that theoretically it can be done. Whether it is being done is a different issue. Uh, I have to tell you that no, um, from 2003 to 2020, we have not traveled the path where actually people start experimenting with use of setting up small power generation plants in their colonies to take care of their power needs. But theoretically, under the provisions of the Act, it is possible. Next. The second is open access. So once you generate electricity, you need to have a carrier through which the electricity is transferred, isn't it? That's why you have provisions for uh, the uh, and under the provisions of the Electricity Act, access to open access is a right which is statutorily given to you under the provisions of the Act. Um, the provisions of the open access users under the Act enable heavy users with more than one megawatt connected load to buy cheap power from the market. The concept is to allow customers to choose from a number of competitive power companies rather than being forced to buy power from the local utility monopoly. It only not only helps industrial and commercial consumers by ensuring regular electricity supply at competitive rate, but also enhances the business power market. Open access helps consumers to meet the renewable purchase obligations. As the name suggests, RPO is an obligation on state power distribution companies. Now, what has happened? Not only has it become uh, necessary for the state to encourage um, power through other renewable power options like uh, wind and solar, but it is also necessary for the various state electricity boards to buy and also for uh, private uh, users to buy a particular percentage of their consumption, uh, which are manufactured through this RPO methods. So there is an obligation which is imposed, which is called the RB, uh, RPO. There are once again nuances relating to that, which you can understand if you uh, go a little in depth into the site of the, into the subject. Next. It also, the act also encourages competition at the micro level uh, as the distribution is liberalized and uh, the distribution networks are allowed along with the introduction of open access and the consumers will have the choice of electricity supplier as there will be competition at micro level, the consumers will uh, have better service for reasonable price. This is the uh, basis for uh, encouraging this. As they say, the role of the regulatory commission is to ensure 
that there is more competition in the field because as they say the the, the power and the duties of any regulator uh, in an area relating to competition is to see that competition is preserved protected and propagated uh, and it is no business of the regulator to protect the competitors the competitors are not the subject matter of protection uh, both under the competition act and in many of these regulatory acts the purpose is to ensure that competition is protected therefore starting from the micro level to the highest level the provisions of the electricity act mandate that competition must be encouraged and protected next trading in electricity is also no permitted you have this ies uh, exchanges and uh, like the stock market on a day to day basis the power uh, charges vary uh, all the purpose of all this is to ensure that the consumer has a choice one of the most important thing um, with regard to a consumer's right is uh, a right of a choice to the consumer and this ensures that if uh, i can go in for my own captive generation plant if my captive generation plant on a particular day is costlier than my purchase through the exchange i then buy through the exchange if my uh, exchange price and the captive generation plant are going to be more expensive expensive than the state electricity board power on that day i take the state electricity board power so these are various choices that are now available to a consumer simultaneously just because you have a captive generation plant it does not mean that you cannot go for uh, iex exchange all this uh, is is in general and as i said it is all subject to the uh, regulations which have been brought out by the regulatory commission but in general these are the principles that are supposed to apply next authorities to resolve conflict the other important provision is the electricity act provides for a hierarchy of authorities now this is very very important for a lawyer to know which complaint should i take before which authority many times complaints get thrown out because uh, wrong authorities are approached with regard to uh, adjudication of issues which are not within their purview so it is essential for a lawyer to understand the hierarchy of authorities created under the provisions of the electricity act it for a, uh, there are two actually there are two uh, different uh, compartmentalized columns as far as dispute resolution is concerned one is between the consumer and the uh, licensee the state electricity board in most cases but if it is privatized any licensee so uh, that that hierarchy is different from the hierarchy between the generator and the licensee that again is a different column right so the hierarchy as far as the consumer and the licensee is concerned the lowest level is the cgrf as we call it here in tamil nadu i don't know what they are called there is a consumer grievance redressal forum each superintending engineer has a consumer grievance redressal forum and from this order you can file an appeal to the ombudsman from the ombudsman order if you do not find the order of the ombudsman satisfactory you have to go to the high court by way of a writ petition now as far as the disputes between the generator and the licensee are concerned generator licensee disputes can only be taken before the electricity regulatory commission from the orders of the electricity regulatory commission you have to go on appeal to aptel which is the authority uh, at delhi and is the apex authority as far as uh, this hierarchy is concerned that is the hierarchy relating to the generator and the licensee and from any order of aptel you can go to the supreme court there is a third hierarchy which is the supreme court has clarified in the ptc case that in respect of regulations brought out by uh, the electricity authorities the um, uh, the neither the ombudsman nor the cgrf nor the uh, electricity regulatory commissions have jurisdiction over them and it is only the high courts which can be approached uh, with regard to a challenge relating to any regulations brought out by the electricity regulatory commissions and from the order of the high court obviously an appeal will go to the supreme court so there are three compartments really which determine on the basis of the nature of the complaint which you take before these authorities which authority is empowered to uh, to determine which issue i go to the next please the transparent regulator the act enables not only operation of trading regime in electricity but also provides for a regulator hence the electricity act has provisions for uh, irc at the central level as at, uh, also at the state level next 
Okay, go to the next. Reorganization of state electricity boards is again in a very important aspect. The Electricity Act encourages the appropriate governments to recognize the state electricity board. There is punishment of theft of electricity. I will deal with it a little more uh, towards the end of my presentation. Um, it also provides for punishment of electricity. It creates separate courts. Uh, I would say, instead of, probably the word that I should be uh, using is, it empowers the notification of separate courts to deal with complaints relating to theft of electricity. We go to the next. Understanding the key concepts under the act, you need to understand the concept of national electricity policy, which I talked to you about some time back. Um, it is basically to deal with laying guidelines, accelerated development of power sector, providing support electricity to all areas and protecting interest of consumers and other stakeholders, keeping in view available of energy resources, technology available to exploit these uh, resources. All this is dealt with, as I told you, it is a map. The government is laying down a map for uh, traveling down that path. Next. Then there is a national electricity plan that assesses in the country in this year, how much demand will there be and how are we going to provide for it? The assessment of demand is an important prerequisite of planning capacity addition. Section 3.4 of the Act requires the Central Electricity Authority to frame national electricity plan once in five years and revise the same from time to time in accordance with the national electricity policy. So these two have to act in tandem. They need to be coordinated, the national electricity policy and the national electricity plan. The combined objective of these two is to lay down the, the policy after assessing the requirements of a nation at, for the next five years. It's like the five-year plan that we used to have in economics earlier, a equivalent of that of the national electricity plan. Next. So generation, as I told you, has been completely delicensed, has been put in a highly liberalized framework for generation. There is no requirement for licensing of generation. The requirement of techno economic clearance of CEA for thermal generation is no longer there. For hydroelectric generation, also the limit of capital expenditure above which the concurrence of CEA is required would be raised suitably from the present level. Capital generation has been spread from all controls. Next. Transmission central government will facilitate the continued development of the national grid. The national grid is like the NHA. It is National Highways Authority of India. Like that in the electrical sector, you have a national grid which takes power. So today, uh, the power um, generation in say some part of Rajasthan is very good. It is possible to transmit the power from Rajasthan here to Tamil Nadu. And the basic infrastructure by which that is done uh, is through these large transmission lines. The central transmission utility and the state transmission utility are authorities which have been created to constantly keep upgrading the facilities for transmission in a state. Next. The distribution. Now, after you get the power, let's assume you get the power from Rajasthan. It comes all the way from Rajasthan through these transmission lines and then it reaches uh, Tamil Nadu. You need to have an agency which will collect that power and to distribute it. It is like a farmer producing something in the agricultural field. He grows the crops, it is transported, it comes to a mandi here. After it comes to a mandi for it to reach you, it has to come to the local provision store. The person who is in charge of taking it from the mandi and bringing it to your local provision store is the distributor. The person who operates a lorry and brings it from where the farmer produces the produce and brings it to uh, the mandi is a person who is in charge of the transmission. This is the basic analysis. Distribution is the most critical segment of the electricity business chain. The real challenge of reforms in the power sector lies in efficient management of the distribution sector. The, the act provides for a robust regulatory framework for distribution licenses to safeguard consumer interest. It also creates competitive framework for distribution business offering options to consumers through the concept of open access and the licenses in the same areas of supply. Now, what is important about distribution is, even though theoretically distribution has also been delicensed, distribution requires huge investments, right? And most people are uh, very, very reluctant to put in that amount of investment and come into that area uh, because they don't think that they can depend upon governments to give them stable policies. So this is another great threat uh, to development of the electricity uh, sector in India. Someone was asking me about uh, 
the reform bill some of some part of the reform bill i am not going to go into that in detail but some part of the reform bill uh, also seeks to address these issues with regard to how do we uh, um, you know boost the market for distribution in this country uh, how do we get private sector investment into distribution today private sector doesn't want to touch distribution with the barge pole they are afraid because if you if you put in money and create a 1 megawatt generator you are not putting in a whole lot of money and if something goes wrong you can always take this whole investment right it off as a loss but that can't happen with regard to distribution or transmission in which crores and crores will have to be invested so there is no confidence to put the money in that sector as of now and this is what uh, the government is constantly working on it is hoping to improve the climate for investment in distribution lines and some of the uh, reforms that we are talking through the bill uh, all will also address this next then let us come to the basic element of the electricity why does all this exist all this exists to give the consumer a better deal and a consumer means any person who is supplied with electricity for his own use by a licensee or the government or by other person engaged in the business of supplying electricity to the public under this act or any other law for the time being in force and includes any person whose premises are uh, being connected for the purpose of receiving electricity works of a licensee the government or other person as the case may be so this is a very simple definition of the consumer i must also tell you that the provisions of the electricity act do not uh, bar you from going to the consumer protection court um, the consumer courts for relief uh, because uh, as the consumer act uh, in section 3 says that act is not to be read in derogation of other laws and this act also does not prevent a consumer from going to a consumer court therefore this choice is if he has a problem he can go either to the consumer court or he can file an application before the cgr i mean my practical application in my working as far as tamil nadu is tamil nadu is concerned cgr of delivers a judgment much faster than the consumer courts today here in tamil nadu i don't know the experience in other parts of the country but if you have a problem with the electricity sector and you have a consumer and if you think that you should take it to an authority um, it is better for you to go before the cgr the cgr is also um, you have a representation of a consumer organization in cgr of in tamil nadu i don't know how it is Uh, in other parts of the country, which makes those uh, authorities very, very effective and efficient. Next, can I go to the next? And a distribution licensee, likewise, means a licensee authorized to operate and maintain a distribution system for supply of electricity to the consumers in this area of supply. Um, the Electricity Act 2003. No, but the licensing is still necessary for a distribution licensee. As I told you, for generation, it is not necessary. but it will be still be subjected to rules and regulations but as far as the distribution licensee is concerned it is essential to have a um, um, license and you can't do that work without a license next state electricity regulatory commissions are actually the spine and backbone of this entire system uh, and every state government is required to constitute for the purpose of the electricity act a commission Uh, to be known as the national state electricity regulatory commission the purpose powers and duties of the electricity commission are set out uh, in the electricity act primarily there are three types of functions which a state electricity um, commission does uh, it sets down the laws rules and regulations which it is empowered to pass under the provisions of the electricity act secondly it adjudicates disputes between the licensee and the generator thirdly it also has a consultative role to play so when the state governments want to consult the state commission they are free to do that under the provisions of the act therefore there is a, a threefold uh, a duty cast on the state electricity regulatory commissions to perform um, and if they perform what has been assigned to them then the electricity sector can really uh, undergo a transformation which is the purpose of the act itself next the dispute address effect i have already told you about it i don't want to dwell more on it uh, it is a cgrf uh, ombudsman and from there to the uh, high court um, in respect of the consumer uh, generator licensee disputes it is at the first level to the state uh, commission and from there on to aptel and from aptel to the supreme court and if you want to challenge uh, regulations it is going to go to uh, primarily the, um, the high court and from there it goes to the supreme court so this is uh, the, these are the three uh, uh, main 
uh, compartments. There is, of course, the fourth compartment with regard to electricity and uh, unauthorized use of power, which also I will come to. Next. Standards of performance, once again, under Section 57 of the Electricity Act, the state electricity regulation, after consultation with the legacy, every state electricity commission is supposed to lay down the standards of performance. For example, if I apply for an electricity connection, how long should my application, uh, within what time should my application be disposed of, is a subject matter of standards of performance. It also says that if I apply for an electricity connection and connection is not given within 30 days, then I am entitled to compensation. These are standards of performance which uh, the state uh, the state commission has a duty to set down. All states, they have set down uh, these standards of performance. If I have to buy a meter, what must be uh, the nature of the meter that a consumer must buy? How quickly must it be installed? All this is supposed to be regulated under the standards of performance. And even if I have um, if I have an unscheduled power cut, let us assume I have an unscheduled power cut for an entire day. It uh, the, the standards of performance authorize me to move the consumer grievance address forum for compensation if I have suffered unscheduled power cut. Still in the country. There are large areas which undergo unscheduled power cut, but unfortunately, the awareness that you can go before a CGRF and claim compensation is not very well known, and therefore, we do not keep tab of all the unscheduled power cuts that we have, uh, nor do we approach the CGRF for this compensation, but under the provisions of the Act, you can approach those authorities. Next. Open access is what I have told you. It is just an access to a carrier which will take your uh, electricity um, 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 as soon as it is generated, as soon as it is manufactured. You need a carrier who will bring it to you. Uh, and that is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the open access provisions. And these are dealt with in section 42 of the Act. Next. Plant load factor, as I told you earlier, this is a very important component and is a measure of how uh, effectively and efficiently your machinery and your establishment is functioning. One of the major achievements of the power sector has been a significant increase uh, from 2003 to 2020. One of the things that we have uh, actually achieved is the power, uh, plant load factor of many of the uh, establishments are doing pretty well, which is an indication that our entire system is becoming better and better. Next, metering, the act mandates supply of electricity through a correct meter within a stipulated period. The authority should develop regulations as required under section 53, 55 of the act within three months. The act requires all consumers to be metered within two years. The SERCs may obtain from the distribution licensees the metering plans, approve these and monitor the same. These again become the responsibility of the state electricity regulatory commissions. Today, in respect of most of the industrial unit, it is possible for the electricity board. Previously, they used to come for inspection, checks, etc., etc. Now, the metering is so effective that they don't have to leave their office at all. They just need to sit there and monitor when there is a hike in the consumption, when there is a dip in the consumption, uh, detect abnormalities in the consumption pattern. All this they can do sitting in their own offices. That is the advantage with bringing in a better uh, metering system. Next. So cross subsidy surcharge is very important. What is this cross subsidy surcharge? Uh, primarily, uh, the, the argument with regard to cross subsidy surcharge is this, that if I, uh, if the, the generator spends, let's say, 100 rupees to generate uh, one unit of electricity, then uh, from that, some part of it is spent towards uh, supplying electricity to uh, the less privileged sections of society, like agriculturists, like hut dwellers. All these people are supplied electricity either at nil price, which is not a very good thing to do, or at highly subsidized rates. So therefore, the uh, price uh, which uh, electricity generator charges you includes that subsidy component. Now, if you're going to move away from that, and if you're going to go to a private producer and buy his power, then the electricity state electricity board or the licensee loses that money. Therefore, to compensate the state electricity board for that subsidy component, it loses when the consumer goes away from the state electricity board and goes to a private producer. This concept of cross subsidy surcharges introduced. 
and that is determined by the state electricity regulatory commission it says you are free to go to a um, power producer um, and you are free to take the power from him but if you do in addition to what you will pay him you will also pay a cross subsidy surcharge to the state electricity board to compensate the state electricity board which is then providing subsidized power to poor people now that is the concept of a cross subsidy uh, surcharge and there is plenty of litigation with regard to this um, and once again many matters turn up before the electricity regulatory commission and by the, before that till on how exactly it is to be levied and what are the contours what can it not exceed what are the limits within which it should be uh, collected all this have become subject matter of a lot of uh, litigation next you go to the next so what are the basically the nature of complaints that land up before the consumer court um, <clears throat> a delay in sanctioning new connection electricity meter running fast unscheduled load shedding erratic erratic power supply low excess voltage supply voltage fluctuation not replacing burnt meter delay in restoration of supply due to distribution failure delay in transfer of ownership category delay in reconnection subsequent to disconnection due to non payment delay in refund of advance consumption deposit consumption security meter security delay in shifting of meter connection lines non issue of due certificate delay in redress of complaint these are largely consumer related complaints this is not between the generator and the licensee this is all in the nature of the type of complaints that go before the cgrf and before the overs next consumer grievance redressal forum therefore have the powers to deal with these types of complaints next please the powers of the cgrf have jurisdiction to entertain the complaint filed by complainant with respect to electricity service provided by the distribution licensee and to take up a suo moto the same fulfills the requirements specified the forum shall entertain only those complaints where the complainant has approached some appropriate authority, authority of licensee as prescribed in the complaint handling procedure therefore there are procedures laid down you can go into the website of the electricity regulatory commission of the state it gives you all the particulars with regard to this next Uh, next this is all a continuation of that so this is this again is uh, powers of the electric. then the higher authority is electricity ombudsman if a consumer is still not satisfied by the order of the country he can file and make a representation before the ombudsman matters there are certain areas which are excluded section 126 127 135 139 or 167 of the electricity act are are areas which are uh, reserved for other authorities and you can't go before the cgrf or the electricity ombudsman with regard to complaints relating to the state next <clears throat> next the most important aspect of uh, uh, the electricity law is the determination of tariff unlike in the past uh, electricity tariff is not determined either by the now it has become a uh, it, uh, it it has become an economic process how do you determine a tariff previously it used to be Uh, determined by the state government and you have any number of supreme court judgments which say that this is a legislative function and therefore the power of the court to in interfere with the setting of tariff was extremely limited but now it has become a statutory function this is why against that function uh, an appeal lies what primarily does an electricity regulatory commission do when it sets tariff there is something called the arr arr is the annual revenue requirement i manufacture uh, electricity i sell electricity i spend 100 rupees in manufacturing electricity under the provisions of the uh, electricity act and the rules and regulations framed thereon annual revenue requirement is a cost of all that what material i need what wages i pay pay, pay to my employees what money i spend in maintaining the equipments Uh, what do i do by way of uh, upgrading my equipment all this is part of the arr so first thing that the um, the state electricity regulatory board has to do is it has to submit all the bills for that and say that listen this is how much i have to spend the next year uh, with regard to uh, maintaining infrastructure 
Now the commission takes into the takes note of that, and then it sees how many units are uh, are manufactured, how many units are generated by the state electricity board, and then it comes to a mathematical exercise for this amount of electrical energy for you to generate. And if this is your spending, how much must you charge per unit? Then it arrives at a as an average figure. From that average figure, subs there are two classes of consumers: subsidized classes of consumers and subsidizing classes of consumer. A subsidized class of consumer is a consumer who is paying less than this cost of manufacturing one unit of electricity, right? And a subsidized subsidizing consumer is somebody who is manufacturing, who is paying more than this cost of manufacture of power. And a subsidized consumer is somebody who is paying less than this uh, cost of uh, manufacturing one unit of power. The act now requires. Why did the state electricity boards land up with huge problems? They land up with huge problems because there was a mismatch between what they generated, what they spent. And what they could recover from the government, so all of them went into losses. Now the Electricity Act says that you can't do that. Now what the government has to do is, if it says these classes of consumers are, uh, I'm going to subsidize, the State Electricity Commission is supposed to fix the cost of that subsidy, and the government will have to pay that in advance. So that, so the scheme is such that in tariff setting, the uh, electricity boards will never suffer a loss. This is the purpose. Uh, of uh, th this is the primary objective of tariff setting to see that state electricity boards do not suffer a loss. If you ask me, in spite of it, why do they suffer a loss? It's a long story. I don't have time to deal with it here now. Um, uh, but in spite of it, they if they because the tariff setting process is in the first place not very accurate. There is delay in uh, recovering the money from the government, and the uh, tariff is not set every year as it should be. Uh, these are various multiple complications which lead to still uh, there being a shortfall between the generation of electricity and what the state electricity board is able to recover from its customers. Next, go to the next. Yeah. So all this is uh, the tariff determination process. I put it all here for you to lead at uh, leisure. As I said, within the time frame uh, available, it's not going to be possible for me to go into all this. But uh, I've made these notes for your uh, use and utility because you can go through this in greater detail. Will you come to the last part where we have this uh, <clears throat> set of case laws? Because uh, I think the last slide has the list of case laws. Just go beyond this. The last slide has this uh, case. This I have sort of set out the scheme of the act. This again is for your uh, instruction and for your information. Uh, you can go through this um, at leisure. I will come to the last part uh, with regard to the major cases that have been decided under the um, Electricity Act. And then uh, these are the important judgments. Please go to that before that. Well, West Bengal Electricity Regulatory Commission, if you want to understand the electricity regime, please read these uh, acts in detail, the, these case laws in detail. These are very, very important. I'm not saying that these are exhaustive, uh, but these are very important for you to understand. Uh, please, please go to. I have also given a brief note, primarily West Bengal ERC versus CERC. The question before the Supreme Court was whether the consumers have a legal right or not to be heard in the proceedings. Uh, this was under the 1998 uh, Electricity um, the Regulatory Commissions Act, uh, because for the first time, previously the consumers would not be heard when a tariff was fixed, but for the first time under the Electricity Regulatory Commissions Act, uh, a right was given for the consumers to be heard. And this right was upheld by the Supreme Court in this judgment. Go to the next one. So this case is also important as to whether the High Court sitting as an appellate court. Previously, when this uh, judgment was passed, APTA was not in existence. So um, the matter, the appeals would go to the High Court. But the question there was, when I go to the High Court as an appellate authority, this question arises frequently. When a High Court is functioning as a statutory authority, it's its, its powers are circumscribed by the provisions of the statute. It cannot uh, borrow from its uh, Article 226 powers uh, because it is only functioning as a statutory authority. This principle was also laid down in this case. Next. The next question is who determines the tariff? 
all that was decided in the, the, that case. PTC India Limited versus CERC is very important for creating the third compartment that I was talking about. Uh, it said that neither the State Commission nor ACTEL can uh, go into validity of regulations brought out by the state government or the commission itself. For example, the State Electricity Commission brings out a regulation which is not in line with the law. You can't go before the State Electricity Regulatory Commission itself and to file a complaint there. So this compartment, the third compartment that I was talking about was created on, um, um, through this judgment and they said that this can only be challenged before the High Court and the Supreme Court. Next. It, this case is also important for a whole lot of other issues which I have set out here. Please read this judgment extensively. It will give you a very good uh, um, you know, uh, um, bird's eye view of the Electricity Act and what the authorities under the Act are supposed to do. Next. Next. All these are the questions that have been decided in this case. And uh, CESA Sterlite is on the issue of uh, cross subsidy surcharge, how it must operate, how it applies, etc., etc. And uh, this again is very instructive on the issue of cross subsidy surcharge. Next. Gujarat Urja Vikas Nigam Limited is an interesting case which went into whether the provisions of the Arbitration Conciliation Act will apply or the provisions of the Electricity Act will apply in respect of appointment of an arbitrator. It invoked that principle of interpretation of statutes, which said that the uh, <clears throat> specific will always override the general. Arbitration Act 1996 is a general provision, but when under the provisions of the Electricity Act, you have powers for the uh, commission to appoint arbitrators, only that can be invoked. Next. The Tamil Nadu Distribution Limited was a PPN is again an important uh, um, judgment which held uh, that uh, the first appeal under the Electricity Act can re-examine the regulator's discretion with regard to if the regulator had uh, the State Electricity Regulatory Commission has appointed an arbitrator. The question was whether AFTEL could go into the question and determine whether the appointment of the arbitrator was correct by the State Commission. And the uh, court also held that. Uh, it could be done, and uh, the um, actor was empowered to do that. This also laid down a very important principle, which I then took to the High Court, um, uh, and it said that the Electricity Regulatory Commission uh, must be headed by a person who has basic judicial training. And it said that it should be headed by a High Court judge. Um, therefore, I filed the repetition before the High Court to say that our State Electricity Regulatory Commission must be headed by a High Court judge. Uh, Gujarat also a similar judgment was given, which said that um, it should be headed by a High Court judge. The matter ultimately went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court uh, read it, went into the provision to the Act and said uh, it uh, partly allowed our arguments and said that, yes, um, what you're saying is right. The commissions must have a legally trained mind, but it is not necessary that that legally trained mind must be the chairman of the commission. But one of the members must have a legal training on account of which under the, uh, before the Tamil Nadu Electricity Regulatory Commission, we now have uh, a judicially an extra district judge to be one of the members of the Electricity Regulatory Commission. And the regulatory commissions all over India now have at least one judicial mind among the three members. Next. <clears throat> Reliance infrastructure versus state of Maharashtra is all about the power of the commission to set tariffs and uh, uh, how tariff policy is important. For example, if a tariff policy delineates and specifies a particular thing which must be done by the State Commission, the State Commission cannot ignore that and set the tariff. And therefore, the implication of the national tariff policy in uh, tariff setting was examined by the Supreme Court in this case. Next. Best versus BERC, the Regulatory Commission, this is an important issue with regard to the first compartment that I talked about in respect of disputes, that in respect of a dispute between a consumer and a distribution licensee, the proper authority to examine that would only be the Consumer Grievance Redressal Forum. And in this case, the appropriation of that jurisdiction by the State Electricity Regulatory Commission was held to be improper by the Supreme Court. So this is very useful for that first compartment of disputes that I talked to you about. Next. Best, once again, this also uh, go to, goes into um, the issue of uh, consumer filing a petition before the commission. 
and, to, and it was pointed out that uh, such petitions will not like there is uh, there is one one area in which a consumer can actually approach the commission straight away and that is where the regulations are not being implemented properly where the regulations that are being framed by the commission are not being implemented by the authorities properly my argument would be that uh, the powers under the electricity act empower the commission even on a complaint by the uh, consumer to deal with it and to punish the uh, licensee or any authority who is acting in you know, derogation this is a position that i have uh, uh, also argued before aptel that the power is uh, available and some of these matters are still been pending before the um, before aptel for aptel to take a decision on that but that alone i would say that there is power for a complaint to be filed by a consumer if any of the regulations are being consistently being flouted by the licensee next please. this again is an um, elaboration of that judgment tata power and reliance energy limited plays is a very important judgment on competition uh, and how competition between for example in this case tata power and reliance energy is important and is in the interest of the consumers so uh, the court gave due recognition to the objective behind the electricity act to promote competition and give the consumer an option to choose so anything that is in derogation of this right of choice of the consumer the court frowned on as it did in this case next so this generally is the conflict is i will quickly deal with one important issue uh, which mr vikas wanted me to deal with and which is with regard to the difference between section 126 and 135 very simply there are two important judgments that is not part of my compilation so please note it executive engineer versus sita ram rice mills 2012 2 acc page 108 that uh, uh, considers uh, extensively the difference between section 126 and 135 and now there is a recent judgment which is the west bengal um electricity distribution company corporation versus orion metal private limited which is 2019 scc online 1077 i don't think this has been uh, reported in the scc but it is the scc online west bengal state electricity distribution company versus orion metal o r i o n metal private limited it is 2019 scc online 1077 so these two cases if you read primarily the difference is this Section twenty twenty six is with regard to unauthorized use of electricity. In an unauthorized use of electricity, the electricity department need not prove any dishonest intention. Right? There is no necessity for the department to prove any dishonest intention. Section one thirty five is a criminal offence, and as you all know, that a criminal offence for it to be established, you have to prove dishonest intention and a complaint will have to be filed before the police and the police will have to file a uh, further proceedings before the uh, court that has been designated under the provisions of the section 135 many times the question arises can a person be sued simultaneously for section 126 and 135 this is one question that frequently arises section 126 let us assume there is a case where i am a tenant of the property there is somebody who has used the premises earlier my earlier tenant has tampered with the meter and he has caused some loss to the electricity department the electricity department did not detect this at the time when it was used by the previous tenant but when i came into possession of the tenancy they conducted an inspection and they found that electricity there is unauthorized use of electricity now the question is uh, can they proceed against me for theft of electricity no they can't proceed against me for theft of electricity but can they proceed against me for unauthorized use of electricity yes because i whether i have an intention or not i am still using electricity uh, which is um, which is not the manner in which it should be used according to the terms and conditions right that is one example the second example is suppose my sanction low is a particular kva and i use more than that right 
So am I using unauthorized use of electricity? Yes, because I am authorized to use only a sanctioned demand. And I exceed that sanctioned demand, and on an inspection done by the authorities, it is shown that I have exceeded the sanctioned demand. Therefore, I am liable for unauthorized use of electricity. Therefore, the primarily, the, if you read these two judgments, it will be clear that under Section 126, what needs to be assessed by the electricity department is only the loss that is caused to them on account of unauthorized use of electricity. The establishment of an intention is not necessary at all. Whereas for the department to succeed in a case of section 135, they must show that there has been dishonest intention. For example, in a dishonest intention, I go and break a meter. I go and break an equipment. On account of that, I try to take an advantage, but no advantage actually ensues. Right? In that case, I am guilty of theft of electricity. I can, it cannot be said that there is no case because I don't have a case under 126 because I have not actually benefited from this entire process. You can't file a case against me under section 135. There would be cases where complaints can be maintained purely under 135. There would be cases where complaints can be filed purely under 126. There would be cases where complaints can be filed simultaneously both under 126 and 135. All this depends upon the nature of the uh, offense that is alleged and the circumstances surrounding the charge and complaint against me. That is the most important determinant and it has to proceed only on the basis of that. So this, I think, answers uh, issues with regard to section 126 and 135. I am thankful to you for giving me this opportunity. I've gone on for one and a half hours. But as I said, this is a vast motion um, and uh, there is much to learn. And it is a great area for lawyers to, to actually start specializing in. Thank you once again for giving me this. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, as rightly said that the act is very vast. And as we were discussing early, earlier also, then one aspect which we would like that we can specifically have one webinar on this 126 and 135 because primarily young lawyers invariably get the litigation qua whether it is an unauthorized connection or whether it's a theft and whether the jurisdiction would lie under section 153 or not against that as to with, uh, what are the remedies for that. And then next question arises is normally one feels that once the laying down of the lines is there as to whether the Land Acquisition Act will prevail or the provisions of section 10 to 16 of the Telegraph Act would prevail. So uh, we will bother you once again and ask you to give uh, insights on these aspects also. Because at least I have seen in Punjab and I quote, these two type of litigations are primarily there as to whether uh, that electricity theft, if you have done, it is compoundable or not, whether the FIR could be quashed, whether if, uh, if we see that unauthorized connection, they always say that unauthorized connection would be like, you have taken a connection of five kilowatts, instead of three ACs, you are installed the fourth AC. So it becomes an unauthorized oh. overhead. And the theft would be what we say a Kundi connection that you take an electricity from a source which is not actually being detected to a meter. So these subtle differences we would like that you should share your knowledge on 126, 135, and section 67 of the Telegraph Act as to whether it will be notified or not. We will have a separate. Uh, yeah, separate that's what I'm saying. I know that. In fact, uh, because I do not know about Madras, but in our side we have primarily this type of litigation especially of the laying down of the lines. They say that it's my farm, farmer's land. My land has been totally spoiled. They say that I should be compensated. Then that Kerala start state transplantation case, a uh, plantation case comes wherein they said how, how you have to assess and give the, this thing because right of compensation is only qua the damage done, not of, because the land is not acquired. You continue to retain the, and become the, uh, you are always the landowner itself. Two, three questions have come in. We will deal with it uh, in a separate session. There is also the works of licensee rules and regulation. There are a lot of rules and regulations because in a matter, uh, one of the uh, high court judges uh, wanted clarification of this. They gave him the works of licensee regulation. So um, many of the lawyers don't know that these regulations exist and actually regulate the manner in which transmission lines should be laid and the authority to whom we can file a complaint for uh, compensation and uh, what are the powers of that authority. Uh, all these are uh, set out in various rules and regulations. 
and we only see the act. So uh, the, those are important topics, but I said it is very vast. What yeah, possibly yeah. you can take this four or five important questions. Uh, you can probably call it five important questions in electricity laws, and we can uh, discuss it. So that's what I'm saying. 126, 135, 153, then section 67 of the Electricity Act. According to me, these four sections are, uh, and fifth one would be as to those who are practicing on the PSR EC, we say Punjab State Electricity Regulatory Commission or HERCRC, what you said, the regulatory commission. But that is a very niche area where that yeah. requires a super specialization of the regulatory commissions. Because how the transmission layer, how the tariff tariff rates would be calculated, how the annual assessment would be there. Yes. Uh, this is Dr. Shiri Kant. With the emergence of the EVs, do you see a shortage of production? And if yes, how can the law bring in the regulatory of tariff with the privatization of the charging points, if any? With the, with the generation of? Uh, with the emergence of the EVs, do you see a shortage of production? And if yes, how can the law bring uh, bring in regulate, regulatory of tariff with the privatization of the charging points, if any? No, uh, tariff fixation, there is no problem at all. Um, and as far as uh, um, it, it primarily, we need to have more privatization in the sector as things stand today. Um, and uh, only if the sector is privatized more and more, and uh, we are able to, uh, uh, the, the Electricity Regulatory Commission comes up with some uh, sensible standard for setting tariff. Uh, would there be, and now with the IEX power where I'm able to buy power from any part of the country and at very, very uh, affordable and economical rates, uh, I would say that uh, it is only going to improve. Notwithstanding the fact there are a lot of roadblocks to the SEBs becoming extremely effective and efficient, uh, but what uh, the saving grace is privatization is helping in a large way. Uh. This is again by Dr. Shrikan with regard to cross subsidy. Would you have an opinion as to whether the agreement between the distributor and the producer can be arbitral? Distributor and the generator can definitely be arbitrated. It can only be arbitrated and or it can be decided by the commission. If the commission feels that there are too many intricate aspects to be gone into, the commission has the power to refer the matter to arbitration. But I don't think any consumer can force the commission to refer the matter to arbitration. When it says I am in a position to uh, determine the matter myself. Uh, Stanley is a plaintiff staying in this family property for a long time under his position. The defendant fraudulently got a will and changed the doc government documents, including EB uh, connection his wife's names. The dispute is going on since 2009 in a sub court as a partition suit. Can the defendant give a letter to the EB to close for permanent closure? Since EB connection has been changed from plaintiff's mother's name, in case the EB disconnection the line, what is the remedy for that? See, uh, mm -hmm. EB, EB is not, I don't know about uh, the position in other parts of the country, but as far as Tamil Nadu is concerned, the EB is not concerned about family disputes at all. EB is only interested in supplying electricity to you and you paying for it. So the system that we have in Tamil Nadu is, whenever something like this crops up, the EB gets an indemnity bond from you saying that, Whatever be the uh, ultimate outcome of these litigations, I will be the person who will be responsible for making the payments. In fact, the law in Tamil Nadu too is to that extent where it says, even if you put up a construction in, let us assume, government forumbo land, as we call it here, still the electricity board has to give connection and it has to supply and it has to collect the charges for the supply that uh, it, it makes. So leave alone a, a dispute between the landowner and the uh, uh, somebody else who's claiming uh, rights with regard to the property, even if the dispute is between the government and the person who is illegally occupying government land, still the electricity board cannot refuse to grant connection. And all that the electricity board must be interested is in correcting that for the power that it supplies. And it gets an indemnity bond from the person to say that if for any reason there is to be any issue with regard to this, still I continue to be responsible. So one Armstrong has asked the question, but I think we will take it in another webinar. <coughs> what are the procedures for EB to follow in the case of theft of wire and in case of theft of energy? This was we are saying, until unless we understand that concept, this question will be done. Johnny? 
uh what are so all these all these are what are the procedures of eb to follow in the case of theft and in the case of theft of energy all this as i said are regulated by different rules and regulations which have been uh, formulated by different commissions so uh, you will have to there is no uniform rule that applies right across the country every electricity board has brought out its own regulations to regulate this uh, and therefore i can't give a general answer with regard to this yes so we have no other questions i'm just telling about the yes tomorrow's webinar before we part for the day tomorrow the webinar would be on burden of proof vis a vis the owners of proof and standards of proof this is by justice uh, mandata uh, sita raman murthy a former judge of andhra pradesh do log in at 5 pm for the insights on a quite an intriguing topic and thank you to all the participants who have been watching us live on the facebook and on this platform and thank you to mr anil raja the senior advocate a topic which is quite vast but it was funneled in the right perspective which every common man can understand and we will be sharing these notes on the whatsapp group uh, and thank you once again sir it was a pleasure hearing namaskar sir jai hind to everyone